Uh, there is no plan for a second referendum. Now, governments, as I say, can change things if they wish. But to be on honestly, I would say to everybody and anyone that's watching this, the choice is simply, are we going to leave or stay in on that date? And then we're bound by that. Just how does it feel? I mean, as a loyal cabinet minister, yep. who's been in the cabinet since 2010, um, how does it feel to suddenly find yourself completely at odds with the leader of your party and the prime minister? Well, it's not easy. Uh, it's never going to be easy when you take a decision to uh, not to back your government. It's particularly difficult if you're in cabinet where collective responsibility is ultimately the thing. You agree in cabinet and then you're bound by that. This is unusual, but then it's unusual times. You're responsible for benefits. Yeah. Benefits have played a very big part in the renegotiation. And you've been pretty clear. You don't think what the Prime Minister negotiated is going to make a very big difference, correct? Well, it depends whether you believe that uh, actually this is the main reason why m people are coming here. My general view is there is a limited effect. There's always been a limited effect. Some migrants do come here for the benefits, I'm sure. But the bigger effect is the fact that anyone can come here who is a member of the European Union and then look for a job. And I think the majority come genuinely looking for work. Uh, and it's the problems of the scale of that that displaces communities, causes problems in schools. And that's where my concern is. It's not against migration. It's against the scale of migration and limiting it and therefore controlled migration is the issue, which we can't, of course, do under the treaties of the European Union. So you were disappointed, really. You were disappointed with what the Prime Minister uh, achieved. Yeah, look, I don't think that the agreement, as it stands, actually reverses or changes anything dramatically. But that's not to be... Uh, churlish about there were some successes and I think it is a success to a degree to get any kind of change from the European Union but let's not get this it's been sold as this great moment of change I don't think I believe that my main concern with this is whatever is on the table now may not yet be what we finally use because of course we'll only get this after we say we're staying in and the problem there is that we don't know that the European Parliament won't then modify it, no longer having a threat of Britain leaving. We don't know what the Commission will do or the Council. So there are big issues and big question marks, but notwithstanding that, the big issue, of course, is migration generally, not just the benefits. Can I ask if you stand by your remarks over the weekend in which you brought up the subject of Paris-style attacks? And I, I suppose I'm quite interested in what changes if we leave the EU and why we would be safer from a Paris-style attack. But you stand yeah. by what you said. I am genuinely and deeply concerned about potential threats to this country. I think of all of the capital of cities of Europe, I think London is probably the most significant target other than Washington. It's mm. literally on that scale. So I stand by my remarks. And the reason I stand by them is quite simple in answer to your question. We don't know in the next two years or so those who have actually been brought in as migrants under this present chaotic system, and we have to say it is utterly chaotic, where half these checks are not being properly done, we don't know that they won't be uh, soon either with passports or leave to remain fast-tracked, as some countries do, like Germany. We actually heard a while back that there were some countries that actually sold passports. My point is, in this chaos, it is feasible, I believe, for some people to have basically become eligible within the rules of the European Union and thus be able to come here even through the European rules to our, uh, our borders. And that is just a fact. And so that simply means to me that there is still therefore a threat and that door is not closed. And I simply say having our own control of our borders doesn't mean to say we'd stop everybody, but we'd be able to do a lot more of those checks and demand more of those checks. So, so, so I'm really interested to do, this is really important because this is central to the argument. What are we going to be able to do when an Italian or German passport holder comes to the border that we can't do now. We would be able to create, as we had in the past, a system whereby if we felt that somebody, uh, we felt suspicious about some individual uh, and we wanted therefore not to allow them in, that is our right to say no to them at that particular point. We may also be able to demand further background, further background checks done. We may be able to interrogate. Yes, well, but we're not going to require visas no, from Germany and Italy, are we? It isn't the reality that we require visas. My point is, being in control allows us to decide how we make that check. How do we do it and how but much do we do? But what have we stopped do? from doing now that you would like us to do? That's what I want to know. Well, if we feel that somebody is not... Uh, what we consider to be a reasonable individual, right. we can refuse entry. And how, we can't do that how would we have information about them other than what we would have about them now? 
Well, there are lots of different ways that you get information about people. This is all part of the exchange of information that we want to have, which we have anyway as bilateral arrangements, rather like we have with the United States, where we decide whether people can be uh, allowed in or not. And we know lots of people. We saw what the Paris attacks were about. There were people who had not been checked. But, but you see, when you talk of a Paris attack, I think people might picture bombers in Brussels coming through by car as they drove straight to Paris because there's a borderless zone. But we have a border. We do explosive checks when you come well, on the tunnel. We do tunnels. lots of things. We have two people well. standing at Dover checking the cars yeah. as they come through. It's not the same, yeah. is it? It's but, completely you know, different. We talked about the intelligence arrangements between France and Belgium, but that those aren't good enough to be able to stop the Paris attacks. I mean, when you made the comment about Paris, you, you were up against really quite a lot of quite a senior security, yeah. let's call them the establishment, the security establishment who have taken a very different line. Rob Wainwright, the head of Europol, takes a very different line. We've had comments from a former MI5 director who takes a, a very different line. Who, I suppose this is a, a, an impertinent question, but who should the public believe on this? Should they believe you or should they believe well, they don't have to believe anybody, they just have to make their own judgment about this. Do they think that what I'm saying, if we control our borders, on balance, it is more likely that we will be more secure? I think, frankly, it is impossible to argue that we won't be. It is bound to be that we would have an added element of security. What they're actually arguing may be on a wider case. I'm simply saying right now, if we think we want a bit more security, I think controlling our own borders, and most people watching this would agree with me, I think, means that we would have a greater likelihood of being more secure. I say, simply leave it at that. Ian Duncan-Smith, thank you very much.